I'm Chris Natsume, and I run a studio called BoomZap. We're a casual game developer. We make games for PC and mobile and such like that, and we've been doing so for about 15 years. And this is the second in a five-part video series that I'm doing about running a studio like ours, which is a totally virtual studio, meaning that everybody lives and works at home. Now, I'm doing this, um, as I said in my other video, I know there's a global pandemic happening, a lot of people are being forced into this, and I wanna just make sure that those of us who've been doing this successfully for a long time are sharing as much information as we can about how to do this well. Now, the first video, I talked a little bit about um, why this is a good idea. Now, obviously, this is a good idea right now because you're not allowed to leave your house and that's probably not going away anytime soon. So that's pretty obvious. But I wanted to give all the reasons that we do it, even when there's not a global pandemic, because this will be, you know, I hope all gone someday and we're all going to have to, you know, go back to life as normal. And I would like this to be part of life as normal for a lot of people because I think it's a better way of working. In this video, though, I want to talk a little bit about the things that people tell you can't be done or the reasons why we shouldn't be working like this. Because to be quite honest, most of those reasons are not entirely true and they come from people who don't know what they're talking about or have had a bad experience or have done something, you know, tried to do this and, and not had it work out and they're, they're negative against it. Now, I can tell you from my experience, I've been working in the game industry for 25 years. 15 of those years have been running this virtual studio. And those 15 years have been by far the best, most productive 15 years of my professional experience. And with this studio, uh, we've hired lots and lots of people. We've had huge successes. We've shipped over 50 games, most of them highly rated. Uh, we've been, you know, for those of you who are in the game industry and, and know anything about this stuff, we're featured on Apple and on Google for most of our projects. All the stuff that we did on PC, five out of five stars, you know, number one on the, the, the we've been a critically successful studio and we've been a financially successful studio. We've made millions and millions of dollars in this, um, many millions of dollars doing this. Uh, now, most of those millions of dollars I've paid out to my staff, but for me, more importantly, I've paid millions of dollars to staff around the world and people have had great careers at this studio. So this is a very successful model. Um, and I'm not the only person doing this. There's other great studios that are doing this. When we started, people were very, very resistant to this idea. You know, we started this in 2005 and a lot of people were just flat out, you can't run a studio like that. And, you know, it's, uh, it's funny to me now to look back on those conversations because at some point they were like, no, you can't do this at all. And we, yeah, at the time we were a very small studio. We were like five people. And they said, okay, once we had shipped a game or two, they were like, okay, maybe you can ship a game or two with five people, but you can't do this long term. This isn't, you know, you're not gonna be able to scale this up to like 10 or 15 people like that. You, well, okay. Then we scaled up to 10 or 15 people and we shipped some more games and we had some more success. And they said, well, yeah, okay, maybe you could do a little bit like this, but you know, you could never run multiple projects like this or scale up to a studio that really makes great games. Well, all right. We made a couple number one selling games. We made games that sold a couple million dollars worth of units. We scaled up to like 30 people. And then we have people saying, okay, well, you're probably at your limit now. You probably can't do more than 30. I mean, how are you going to manage that many people? It, I can go on like this. This went on for years. And in the end, we shipped a lot of games. We at, so at one point in our studio, we were 97 people working on 12 separate projects in something like 27 cities around the world. And that was the most profitable year of our existence, right? That's when we made the most money and we were the most successful. So it's very difficult for me to have people say, oh, well, you, you can't work like that. No, absolutely you can work like this. I've done it for 15 years. I know it can be done. I've had huge successes. And I have a track record to prove it. Now, I want to walk through some of the other reasons why you can't do this. Um, and one of the big ones uh, that, that we get, this is the number one reason we get, and it's it's actually the, the most wrong of all of them, but it's also the first thing I hear, is people are like, well, how do you know if they're working? How do you run a studio? How do you know if those people are working? And to me, it's, it, it's such a weird, stupid question, to be honest. I don't. I mean, the, the real answer is I have no idea what my staff is doing at any given time, right? It, it's four o'clock in the afternoon on a Wednesday. What is this artist doing? I don't care what she's doing. It doesn't matter, right? At the beginning of the week, I told this artist, I need these things done and she's got the week to do them. And every day she gives me a daily report and she says, well, this is how far I've gotten on this work. This is what I need. This is what I don't need. And I don't care if she did that at noon. I don't care if she did that. I don't, I don't 
care when she worked. It doesn't matter as long as the work got done. And this is something I want to look at it from a, from a game theory perspective. I'm a game designer. Let's look at the game theory of this, right? Let's take two workers, right? Let's call them uh, Joe and Gail, right? I've, I've got, that's my that's my uncle and my aunt, by the way, right? And, and they're, neither one of them are game developers. I just needed names. Um, let's say Joe's really not good at his job, right? Let's say Joe is a below average worker, right? And Joe goes to work and he does kind of crappy work and he's slow and the work needs to get redone, right? What do we what do we do in that situation? Well, we probably give Joe less work or we take some of Joe's work away from Joe and we give it to somebody else because we need the work done and we need it done right now and I can't wait around for Joe to do it, right? Now, let's look on the other side. Gail's really good at her job. She's a really successful worker, right? And she finishes her work early all the time. What do we in a traditional model do with Gail? Well, we give her Joe's work, don't we? Right? Well, I got to get the work done and it's Wednesday and Joe's behind and Gail's ahead and we have a meeting and we say, okay, Joe, uh, if you're not going to have that done by Friday, maybe Gail can take that work over. Now let's dissect that for a moment. We took our worst worker and the reward for being a crappy worker was to get less work, right? And then we took our best worker and we said, what is your reward for doing a good job? You're going to get more work, right? How perverse is this, right? There is nothing more valuable in the world than time. This is the one thing that we cannot create more of. You cannot buy more of. You cannot make more of. It is all things in the world come from time. Money comes from spending time doing things. Uh, the things that you own come from the money that you earn spending time doing things. Time is the root currency of the human condition. And we are taking that time and saying, if you're a good worker and you effectively use that time, I'm going to waste what time you have left because you're here from eight to five and you can't just like sit around from eight to five and do nothing. I'm going to give you more work to do, right? This is perverse, but this is the way most people operate any kind of work, right? Now, let us pretend for a moment that Gail and Joe are in another room somewhere and I can't see them. Let's say that that room is on the other side of a, the Sea of China, which is true for most of my workers from where I am here in Yokohama. And I have no idea what Gail and Joe are doing all day. But I told Gail and Joe, each one of you gets this box of tasks, this week worth of tasks. And because I'm relatively good at my job and I know what I'm doing and I know how long it should take to do these tasks, I know it's about a week's worth of work. And at the end of the week, Joe's not done. And that's because Joe's been screwing around and doing nothing or, or watching YouTube videos. Or maybe Joe's just not good at his job and it takes him a long time to do this work, right? Gail, on the other hand, she finished everything by Wednesday night. And she spent all day Thursday and all day Friday playing World of Warcraft and, you know, leveling up her, her druid. Great! Everything's working perfectly, right? Because at the end of the week, I'm going to look at Joe's work and I'm going to say, Wow, Joe, you suck. You're going to have to work through the weekend because this was only a week's worth of work and you're not done right now. And if you screwed around all week playing World of Warcraft, well, then I guess you don't get a weekend. And you know what? If I do that three or four times, Joe's going to get increasingly upset. And he's going to say, why am I working weekends all the time? I don't want to work here anymore. And maybe Joe's going to quit. Great. I don't want Joe anyway. Joe was crap. Joe was not a good worker. He was either screwing off or he wasn't good at his job. Or let's say... Maybe a couple after a couple weeks of this, Joe thinks, well, maybe I should stop playing so much World of Warcraft because I'm having to work every weekend, right? I'm actually going to deal with the problem of Joe not being good at his job. Gail, on the other hand, what does she get? She gets two days of playing World of Warcraft or whatever it is she wants to do with her life. Maybe she spends more time with her kids. Maybe she hangs out with her boyfriend. I don't know what Gail does, but I know that Gail does whatever it is that Gail wants to do to make Gail happy which is exactly what I want my staff doing. I want them happy because I want them to stay at my studio because I want a studio that has long retention, right? And so this, this way that we work where we, we don't care what they do, it's, it's very hard to let go of that as a manager. It's very hard to get yourself in that mental space. But it's the number one misunderstanding I think people have because they come from this work equals time mentality. But the whole point of getting good at your job, whether you're a Photoshop artist or a programmer or a writer or whatever, an architect or whatever it is you're doing, the whole point of getting good at your job is to be able to do the job faster. And what is your reward for doing the job faster? 
either A, you get a lot more time off to do the things that you want to do, or B, and this has happened in my studio, I've had people that consistently come to me and say on Wednesday, hey Chris, I'm done with all the work that you told me to do. Is there anything else you want me to do? And if I'm consistently being told that, that person gets promoted and gets a raise because that person is worth more than somebody who doesn't do as much work. Just on a, on a, on a purely, you know, how much money buys me, how many finished tasks level, this person for the same amount of money is getting me a lot more finished tasks. And so they make a very good case for maybe I should pay that person some more money, which is the whole point of getting better at something. It's like that. There's that old, uh, there's that old joke that the, the woman comes in with a broken TV to a TV repair shop. And uh, she says, oh, my TV doesn't run. I need somebody to help me fix my TV. And the guy looks at it and he, uh, he bangs on it with the back of his hand and the TV turns on and he's like, all right, that'll be 50 bucks. And the woman's like, 50 bucks? All you did is bang on the TV. And the guy's like, well, the 50 bucks is for being the guy who knows where to bang on the TV, right? And that's that's really the case, right? If, if you've got somebody who's doing this work quickly, you want to reward them with extra time. You want to reward them with a, a promotion or whatever. So this whole, how do you know if they're working? It's, it's a perverse question and it comes from a place of bad management. And I would say not just in a virtual studio, but in any kind of studio, if you're asking yourself questions about, you know, how many hours is this person in the studio? Or, you know, I wake up every morning and I come to the studio and, and, you know, Joe's here until 10 o'clock at night, but Gail leaves every day at five. Who gives a shit, right? How much work did Joe get done? And how much work did Gail get done? And every one of us has worked in that studio where there's that person who's there until midnight every night and they're complaining about, oh, I'm working so hard. But if you actually look at the output of what they've done, it's minimal. In our studio, I don't know if you were working until midnight. And it's good that I don't know if you're working until midnight because all I need to know is, did you get this thing done? So that's that's thing one. Thing two, and this is this is the next sort of criticism that we get from people. And this one has maybe got a little bit more legs to it, is some people want to be in an office. Some people like it. And I get it. Um, you know, there is, a, there is a social aspect to being in an office. Some people, you know, especially, and I find this is especially true for younger and single people, uh, they take a lot of their social life from the office. Their friends are people that they hang out with from the office. It's a, it's a social club for them as well as being a place that they work. And I get that. I get that that's a thing. Um, and there, there, there are some answers to this. Um, the number one answer is just because you work in a virtual studio doesn't mean you have to stay home. I don't care where you work. And we've certainly had people in our studio that worked in Manila, that, you know, worked from home in Manila. And once or twice a week, they got together at a coffee shop and they worked at a coffee shop. Or sometimes they went to each other's houses and worked with each other. You know, we've actually had people create really strong, really meaningful, long-term friendships in our studio that are still out there. You know, there's, there's, you know, I'm Facebook friends with a lot of people that I've worked with or that work with me now. And it's funny to see how much they kind of keep in contact with people that they worked with at BoomZap because they had formed these strong friendships. And in many cases, because they went out and hung out together after work, etc. But what's important is they separated that social aspect of their work from the professional aspect of their work, which I actually think is very healthy. I actually think a lot of people defining themselves by their work and defining their social life by their work can actually be mentally unhealthy because it means when you lose that job, you lose not just your work, but you lose your, your social life as well, which is problematic, right? Which is why the other answer to this is maybe you should be getting your social life somewhere else. Maybe it's not so great that people are pulling their entire social life from work or people are defining themselves uh, by being an employee of your studio. Maybe it would be better if they also define themselves as being, you know, somebody's dad or somebody's brother or somebody's girlfriend or somebody's best friend. And that thing had nothing to do with your studio. Um, maybe that's actually healthier in the long term. You know, none of us are going to work for the studios that we work for right now forever. Um, knock on wood, I'm, I'm going to retire out of this studio. But theoretically, most of my staff probably won't be here when that happens. They'll have moved on to other things and done other stuff. And that's healthy right? You want that to happen. But if you've got a situation where they're really defining their friendships and their social life through that, that becomes problematic. Um, so that's probably another thing. Um, you can 
And I, I do think there is some level of value to having social relationships with the people that you work with, you know, and there's a lot of there's a lot of people who say, you know, I really get a lot out of those lunchtime conversations with my staff and a lot of our best ideas come from that. Again, you can do that. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. And we, we do this too. We have company meetups. I make a point of going out and physically meeting everybody that works with us at some point. And we have people spread all across Asia and Europe. I've been to Kiev and Jakarta and Yogyakarta. I've been to uh, Manila and Kuala Lumpur and Singapore. And all of these trips were based around, you know, and we didn't work. I didn't like rent an office and we sit down and work. We went out and got drunk. We had a good time. We had dinners together. We talked. I met people. I talked to them about their families and their lives and their hopes and dreams. And that's an important part of being a manager. And if you're going to run a virtual studio like this, that's going to be part of your life and that's going to be part of your budget, right? And it's not just about you meeting those people. It's about those people meeting each other. And that's fine. It's okay to do that every now and then, but you don't have to do it every single day. And so I think this people want to be in the office is better rephrased as a, People want to interact with the people that they work with. And there's no reason why you can't do that in a virtual studio model. In fact, you should be doing that in a virtual studio model. Um, but that's kind of my answer to that. Some people are like, well, you know, maybe this, maybe this works for you, but, you know, we don't work like that. Like, you work like that, but we, we, we just don't work like that. And to me, this is a bullshit answer. This is, this is a really bullshit criticism because... Look, uh, it's it's like telling me that, you know, you can drive a car, but we make buggy whips here and we, we're we really into the buggy whips. So we we have to keep driving buggies here. Maybe cars are good for you, but we're, we're all about the buggy whips. Look, the world evolves. The world moves on. We didn't used to work like this because we didn't used to have the tools that we have now. This Facebook video or well, not Facebook, but this uh, YouTube video that you're watching right now. We didn't have YouTube, what, 15 years ago, 10 years ago. I don't know when we made YouTube, but it wasn't that long ago, right? Um, all of the, I have a whole video about all the tools that we're going to use, and almost none of those tools existed even 10 years ago. We've actually adapted and changed the tools that we use now. Um, you know, the, major, the biggest tool that we use in our studio is called Slack. Slack was not here when we started this studio. We used to run this studio off MSN Messenger, right? Things change. And if you're going to be a creative, constructive studio, you're going to have to change with it. And this idea that like, well, we've just always done it this way, and that's how we work. Yeah, good luck with that, because that's how you become yesterday's company. Um, I, I, and, and, you know, all good things require change, but sometimes that change is forced on you, right? Now, I don't, there's no bigger time to say it than right now. The whole world is being forced to work from home right now because of this damn disease, right? And, of course, the, this won't be the case forever, but we don't know what comes next. We don't, you know, this idea that we can't change the way that we work, well... I guess you have to sometimes, and right now, you have to, right? But I would say it's not just this damn disease, it's other things too, right? The, the world is changing, the way your competition is changing, the way products are made is changing, and if you're not going to change with that, it's going to be a problem for you. So this whole, like, you know, we just don't work like that, well, good luck with that, right? Um, so the next big sort of reason why you can't do this, um, some stuff just can't be done at home. All right, I get it, right? If you're, you know, we, we actually, for a brief period of time, had a brick and mortar studio. And we did because we were working on a particular project where it was a location-based virtual reality project. And the location-based part means you had to put on a suit with a VR goggles with a bunch of motion capture cameras around you. And you had to do that in a specific room. And for us to test that, we obviously needed a room with that, right? So sometimes there are some things where you're gonna need a physical space. Now, when we did that, we didn't move the whole office there. We just put the people that were working on that particular project there and said, this is a thing that you guys have to do. Um, to be honest, we were miserable working like that. It was the worst part of working at BoomZap, just having to come to a studio and me having to fly to Singapore to go in. The, it was not a happy thing for us, but it was a thing that we had to do because that's how we had to work that way. Um, I get it. Some things can't be done from home. But you know what? You'd be amazed at how much stuff people think couldn't be done from home can be done from home. You know, there, there probably was a, you know, there was a time uh, where people said, look, if you want a taxi company, you're going to have to buy a bunch of taxis and you're going to have to have a taxi yard and you have to have a taxi dispatchery and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, now we have Uber and uh, 10 other companies like Uber where basically uh, you're working 
from home, right? You're working from your own car on your own time with your cell phone. This idea that that couldn't be outsourced, it's crazy, right? Um, there was a time in which we thought the only way you could run a hotel business was to go buy hotels. Well, no, apparently Airbnb is a thing, right? There was a time where if you wanted to run a restaurant and you wanted to sell food, you had to have a restaurant where people could come and sit and eat. Well, the disease changed that, didn't it, right? Uh, th there was a time where you couldn't sell drinks, um, but now you can go in San Francisco and go to your, your local place and pick up alcoholic drinks and, and pick up food and bring it home. And there are restaurants that are, you know, they're not thriving, but they're surviving on that. But you know what? Before any of this happened, there were plenty of businesses like Grab Eats and stuff like that that transformed the way that... You, so, you know, re you go all the way down to retail and you say, you know, well, okay, well, you can't do retail from home. What about Amazon partners? What about the thousands of people out there that are selling, I don't know, little Etsy stuff from their house, right? I mean, so much of what they told you, you can't do from home. If you really deconstruct it, a lot of it can be done from home. And in point of fact, companies like Amazon, which was literally started out of some dude's garage full of books, um, they do really well. It'd be difficult to say a company's done better than Amazon, right? So this sort of constant reluctance to my job can't be done that way. I think it's time for you to rethink a lot of that and ask yourself, can it really not be done that way? Are there, and, and really look at what part of this thing is impossible to do without being in this location? What specific part of your argument? Is it the meeting that you can't do? Is it the, the fabrication that you can't do? What part of this? And if you come down to those details and really ask, okay, well, how can we replace this with something else? You would be amazed how much stuff can be done from home. And I can tell you flat out, anything that you can do sitting at a desk, you can do from home, right? Whether you're an architect or a computer programmer or a lawyer or an accountant, you know, uh, my accountant certainly, I've never been to my accountant's office. They tell me he's got one. I've never been there. I've met him at a couple coffee shops, but I don't think he's ever had to go in the office to deal with me, right? Uh, there's so many jobs out there that can very easily be worked from home that it blows my mind that they're not being done from home. A perfect example, my wife works for uh, uh, Nissan and they were very clear on the fact that there was no way that she could possibly do this job from home. Suddenly, when this disease comes and the Prime Minister of Japan says that you have to work from home, hey, guess what? She's downstairs right now on a laptop working from home and it works. Right. And I'm very curious about whether or not they're going to be able to tell all these people when this is over, hey, you got to go back to the office. There's a whole lot of people that are going to be like, uh, why? I was doing just fine at home. So I don't know if I buy the uh, you can't be hung. This whole can't be done from home thing. I question it. The next big one, and I get this a lot, is like, we just can't get that creative spark unless we're all in the same room together. And uh, my answer to that is, uh, nah, that's not true. Now, maybe you're used to working like that, and maybe because you're quite close-minded about the way that you work, um, I think you can only work that way, but that's your problem, right? The idea that it can't be done, I can tell you flat out, we've done incredible creative work. I have friends that run studios that have done incredible creative work, and they've all done it in this virtual model. Um, I would also argue that that, um, you know, and I talked about this a little bit in my last video, that there's there's pretty good science that says that these big brainstorming sessions are not where the real work gets done, et cetera. If you go back and watch that, I've talked about this a little bit already. But there's something else I want to talk about on this point, which is I think this idea that creative work can't be done unless we all sit in a room together, it comes from a place of... Uh, It, it comes from a strange place. Um, there are a lot of people who don't live like you do or work like you do or think like you do or have the abilities to do the things that you do or have obstacles that you don't have who can't work the way that you're working, right? I'll, I'll give you some examples. You know, one of the biggest things that I've noticed since running a virtual studio is this whole introvert versus extrovert question is a lot less in my studio. Now, I can remember having... A bunch of these you know big creative meetings at brick and mortar studios i used to work with in the past and there'd always be like four or five people who kind of ran those meetings and dominated those meetings and then there'd be a bunch of people that kind of hung out in the back and they were they were not contributing a lot and part of me thought back then that the reason that they weren't contributing was because they weren't they didn't have something to say or they didn't have good ideas 
many cases, those people were just very introverted and they weren't very comfortable in that setting, uh, putting themselves out there, putting their ideas out there. But you know what? In a virtual model where stuff is being typed or where they have a little bit more time to put their thoughts together, it's actually much easier for them to get their thoughts out. And so um, I actually think there's a lot of privilege in saying that, you know, we have to be in this way if we're going to work well. There's a lot of people who actually don't work well in the way that you are working, right? Um, there are a lot of people who have uh, physical problems. Uh, if, you know, people who, who are, are, are blind or, or use a wheelchair, um, for those people, there's a lot more struggle for them to get into your office and get into that room and to work with you um, in the way that you're used to working. Maybe some of those people would be a bit better off at home. You know, I mean, they're, they're, you know, your your cost for saying, you know, hey, it's not that hard to get in a subway and go downtown. Well, maybe it's not hard for you to get in a subway to go downtown, but maybe for somebody who's got a sick aunt back home and she's trying to figure out how to take care of her sick aunt, maybe going downtown to be part of your little brainstorm meeting is not the most important thing in her life right now. Saying that they have to work the way that you work because that's how we work. I think that comes from a position of a lot of privilege. And I think that's something that people don't talk about very much. Um, and like I said in my other video, I think a lot of creative work doesn't come from these creative spark meetings. A lot of creative work actually comes from people having the time to take a quiet walk by themselves and think about things. That's where a lot of my creative ideas come from. I think they come from, you know, people watching a video or playing a video game with a with a with a tablet next to them and writing down ideas and then really processing those ideas. You may come up with a lot of ideas in your fancy little brainstorming meetings, but I promise you the vast majority of them are crap and most of them get crossed out. And when you actually investigate and dig down with a lot of those ideas, you find out that they're very shallow. That's what these creative spark big, they tend to produce very shallow ideas. Now, that being said, we do collaborate and I have a whole video talking about how we collaborate, but we collaborate very differently. And I think this whole argument that you need to be in a room full of people to be creatively sparked, I think that comes from an expectation more than a reality, to be quite honest. So the next big thing that I hear when I talk about, you know, we, we run a virtual studio is they're like, how do you keep people from stealing your stuff? You know, they're going to steal your code. How do you make sure that they're not stealing your ideas? All right. A, if that's, if you actually think you've got staff members that are stealing your stuff, I don't care if you're in a virtual studio or brick and mortar studio, they're stealing your stuff, right? Now I've worked at brick and mortar studios where programmers walked out of the studio with all the source code on a thumb drive and went home and rewrote all of that code. I've worked in studios where I've had to go to programmers and look at their code and say, See these comments from another studio in your code? You stole that from somebody. You need to get that out of my code. I've been in both of those situations, and neither one of them had anything to do with a virtual studio. And both of them were studios where there was lots of protections and lots of things to keep people from doing that. You're not going to keep people who want to steal stuff from stealing stuff when it comes to creative content or whatever. That's that's not a thing, right? And you, you have all the protections in the world that you want, but the truth is... Um, this is not more an issue here than it is in normal studios. There's no meaningful difference. And this, this constant belief that you can somehow magically put stuff on a hard drive that people can't get it out of the studio, or I promise you, if somebody puts their mind to it, they can do it. Um, your bigger problem is what kind of people you're hiring and are you trusting them? And whether you're working in a virtual studio or not virtual studio, this is going to, this is going to be a problem. So, you know, I could talk, I could do a whole thing about, you know, how you can, you know, deal with security issues and how you can, you know, blah, 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 blah. There's, the internet has all of that, but the short answer is any of it can be circumvented and it can be circumvented just as easily in your brick and mortar studio as it can in my virtual studio. So this is really a non-question. Um, you know, and, and if, if you don't believe me, think about this for a minute. Your credit card company has everything available online. Your IRA has everything available. Your bank has everything available online. Right. Trust me, if if you can do all of that online and banks have figured out, I guess this is something people can do at their home. I promise you nothing you've got in your company is worth more than the world's bank accounts and the banks of the world have decided this is something that can be done online from home. So there's I, I guess there's a certain level of, of hubris in thinking that somehow your stuff is even more valuable than, you know, 
every bank account HSBC owns? Uh, probably not. Uh, you're going to be okay. All right, so the next big thing I get, big question or issue that people tell me is, you know, what about my company culture? I want to make sure that we have a company culture. And I want to start off by saying, of all the studios I have ever worked in, this virtual studio that I run right now, Booms App, has a stronger, better, healthier company culture of creativity, of supporting people, of people taking care of people, of people teach, treating people with respect. Everything you want in a company culture, it's better in my virtual studio than in any studio I've ever worked with in my entire life. That's a fact. So the idea that you can't have a company culture in a virtual studio, that's just not factually true. I can tell you that's not true. Um, that being said, I would say in many ways, a lot of our culture is better here than what a normal brick and mortar studio would allow. You know, one of the things that people talk a lot about right now in the game industry and in other industries is diversity. And that's a good thing. We should be living in a more diverse world. And for me, it's always kind of a little bit funny because, you know, I probably run one of the most diverse studios in the world. I have people across the world in my studio. You know, this, this idea of, you know, do we have different kind of, we've got people from the Philippines and Indonesia and Singapore and Malaysia. And amongst those people, we have uh, people who are Muslim and people who are Catholic and people who are Buddhist and people who are atheists. We have people who are gay. We have people who uh, are transgendered. We have uh, about 40% of my studio is female. And all of these people, the one thing that they share is they're all judged on the quality of their work. Because that's the, the main thing that they present to the world, right? Um, it, a funny fact, we had uh, a couple people in the studio that for the longest time did not know that one of my staff was male. They thought that this guy was a woman because they never actually, you know, spoke on the phone and they just, they, uh, I won't say who, but they, uh, they had a name that could have been thought of as a male or a female name. And they just assumed it was a female for like two years, right? And they went on with their lives and did stuff it, 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 to the level of, you know, we have a studio that is that is so inclusive that people don't even know who they're being included with. Um, we have, uh, because we have people in, in Indonesia and the Philippines and Singapore and Malaysia, we have a number of Muslim people in the studio. And a lot of people don't even know that the Muslim people in our studio are from Indonesia. They don't, they don't know this stuff. And so we have this incredibly diverse studio where people are being judged the way we all talk about how we want to be judged. We want to be judged by the work that we do. We want to be judged by the ideas that we bring to the studio. And because that's pretty much all you present in a virtual workplace, I think we have a very effective, very diverse workplace where people are treated very equally. Um, it's very easy for me to run a studio like that. And, and not just on the sort of normal slicings of diversity that we talk about. We also have people who are older in the studio. We have people who are younger in the studio. We have people living in rural areas and people that are working in urban areas. And this is something that doesn't get talked about very much. If I run a studio in San Francisco, by definition, everyone in my studio is living in a very urban area. And they're going to think very, uh, they're going to think about the world as someone who lives in San Francisco thinks about it. But I have people that are living in villages of 6,000 people. I have people that are living, like me, in the largest metropolis on the face of the earth. And they're working together on a daily basis. That's diversity, right? So when you talk to me, when you come to me and say, well, what about company culture? My answer to you is, yeah, we have culture better than yours, right? So, you know, and I will say also, because of the way we work, um, a lot of what we do is internalized to our home lives. You know, when I'm working, I'm here in my, my attic working in my, my home, home office. And so this be, I, I internalize this culture a lot because I can bring my home life into my work in a way that a lot of people can't. So we have, you know, obviously like any other studio, we have channels in our, in our Slack for fun and discussion and people talk about that. And it's absolutely fascinating in my studio to have people talk about, uh, especially right now during this disease, you know, we're talking about, well, this is how that's happening. This is how it's playing out in Singapore. This is how it's playing out in Tokyo. This is how it's playing out in Manila. And people are sharing those experiences. And so every day we get this wonderful experience of talking to people from around the world and hearing these different viewpoints and seeing how different things are happening around the world. And it's funny to me that when people leave the studio, they stay way more connected to each other than people who worked at 
uh, brick and mortar studios that I've worked at before, which tells me this is a culture that people want to be part of. People are proud of having worked at Booms App. They think of this as an incredible part of their lives. And this multicultural, international, online experience where they got to talk about their lives and, 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 and share their lives with other people. If that's not culture, I don't know what is. Um, now, maybe you've got a different idea of culture and you're like, no, 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 but the culture I want is this. One of the best things for me about BoomZap is I didn't define this culture. The studio defined that culture and the studio redefines this culture on a daily basis. It's their culture, not my culture. And that for me is really, really powerful. All right, so the next sort of comment that I get from people is, well, yeah, but my studio is too big. You can do that with a small studio, but you can't do that with a big studio. Um, let me start with, a again, I know you feel that way. My experience is different. At the largest this studio ever was, we were 97 people, which for an independent, non-venture capital funded studio, we're still a 100% founder funded studio. For an independent founder funded studio, almost 100 people is very large. Um, and we had that studio spread across, I forget, 27, 28 different cities. Uh, we had 12 different project teams working on mobile projects and PC projects and a, a console project all at the same time. And it worked great. We had minimal management. And at that particular time, if I, you know, historic draw a graph of monthly profitability, that was by far the most profitable this studio has ever been. So to those who say that you can't scale and you can't get it bigger, oh yeah, you absolutely can. Now, there's a lot of information that I have about how we do that and how we do that better. And I will get to that information. It's in, the, it's in one of the later videos I'm going to be doing. So hang in for how we did that. But that, that idea that you can't do that, it's just factually incorrect. You absolutely can do that. Um, the other answer I would have to this is, are you sure your studio needs to be that big? You know, because, you know, what I just told you, if you look back and say, well, we had almost 100 people and we had 12 projects. Well, do the math. That's less than 10 people a project. And a lot of people have told me, how did you run projects that small? Well, because I didn't have a lot of waste in them. And one of the ways in which a virtual studio, I think, is superior is that it exposes a lot of waste. You know, I've worked in brick and mortar studios before and I've seen the levels of management and the producers and the assistant producers and the assistant directors and the blah, 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 blah. And I can tell you that a whole lot of those jobs were unnecessary. And a lot of meetings took place and a lot of conversations took place. And come on, anyone who's worked in the industry knows there's so much waste in what we do. And a lot of that waste comes from unnecessary levels of management. And a lot of those unnecessary levels of management come from bad processes that don't manage a lot of bulk labor well. Uh, I need to get a whole bunch of assets made and how do I get them made well? How do I manage that well? Well, we're going to throw a lot of mid-level managers at it. And so I consistently go out and compete against people who have much larger teams and I'm putting together much better projects. I do that on a consistent basis, um, which... Don't you want that? I mean, as a, as, a, as a manager in a studio, don't you want fewer people in the studio? That costs less money. So that seems to me to be a, a pretty much a pure good. So my biggest answer to, you know, I can't do that with a, with a big studio. A, yes, you can. And B, you probably want a smaller studio anyway. Um, so the last one, and this is actually the thing that gets mentioned the least, the question that I get the least, but it's probably the most relevant one. And I, I bring this up because this is one of the, the biggest struggles that we've had that nobody thinks about or talks about in running a virtual studio is you're not gonna have an IT department. Um, we're not, you're not in the way that you're used to having it, right? In a normal brick and mortar studio, everyone's got the same computer and the same monitor and somewhere in that studio, there's somebody who knows how to fix those and install stuff in them. And when my computer doesn't work, I can get it fixed. And I can just call my manager and say, hey, my computer doesn't work. Can somebody come over here and sort that out for me? This is a thing. This is a real problem. This is a valid issue that you're going to have in a virtual studio. And the more spread out you are, the bigger problem this is going to be. Now, if you listen to the places where my staff are, uh, Manila, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry, the Philippines and Thailand and Indonesia. These are places that are not known for their amazing internet. They're not known for the availability of high quality computer products. Um, they, these are places where quite honestly, we struggle with some of these IT issues. 
And when you've got an artist who's in Elo Elo somewhere and her hard drive crashes, yeah, sometimes it's going to take her a while to sort that problem out, especially if she's not an incredibly technically, uh, you know, not a hardware technically apt person and they're not real sure how to fix all that. Um, I will talk more about this in later videos uh, of how we solve that. The short answer is you're going to have to have some people on your team that know how to help people remotely. You're going to have to have some people that can do that uh, too. You're probably, when you're hiring people, going to want to hire people who are a little bit more independent and a little bit more technical and a little bit more capable of dealing with these problems themselves. Um, and three, it is just going to be a problem. It's going to be a, a struggle that you have. And especially for us, it's a struggle because we deal with, you know, this is the week where we have a flood in Manila and a bunch of people don't have internet in Manila. Or this is the week where the volcano erupts in Indonesia. And you think I'm joking. That was literally three weeks ago. We've forgotten about the volcano because of the disease. But right before this disease happened, uh, we were dealing with a bunch of our staff had to deal with uh, actually the second volcano of the year. We had one in the Philippines and one in Indonesia. So this is something you are going to deal with. It's, it's a cost of doing business. And you're going to have to put it into your schedule and you have to plan for it. Um, and it's funny because this is the thing nobody asks about. And it is probably when I look at what has really been a problem for me, what's really been a struggle, this has been the number one thing. Um, so yeah, that's a problem, but there are ways you can mitigate that. And I think the overall cost of mitigating that is less than the benefit of everything else you get. So it's, it's, it's a reality, but it's not a, it's not a showstopper. So those are my big list of reasons why people tell you you can't do this and why they're wrong. That's the second of my video series on how to run a virtual studio. I have three more videos coming up after this. The next one I am going to talk uh, in a lot more detail about the processes that we use in running our studio and in hiring people for our studio. This probably the got the, the most information rich video for a lot of people who are wanting to start one of these studios and how do you run this Chris? We're going to go into that in a lot of detail. Uh, the next video, I'm going to go into specific tools that we use like uh, Slack and Basecamp and uh, Dropbox, etc. And how we use those tools effectively in a virtual model. And then the last video, which I think is really important for a lot of people who are working from home right now, we're going to talk specifically about how you can work better from home uh, in this in, in this in this time, whether you're in a virtual studio or whether you're just you know working from home for a while. Uh, I'm going to give you some tips on that. So I hope all this is useful. This is going to be put on YouTube. If you have comments, there's a comment section below, but better yet, somewhere here, I'm going to put a link to our Discord. Come to my Discord and chat with me and ask questions. We would love to have people uh, come talk to us. And uh, there you go. I hope this is helpful and thank you very much.